This is the Powerlifting America podcast, and today we're talking all things Sheffield with Heather Connor and Julia Williams. Sheffield was the most important competition in powerlifting history. The team at SBD pulled off something truly special with this event, and it will surely do more than any other competition to elevate our sport to the next level. Thank you to everyone at SBD for all that you do for powerlifting. Sheffield featured eight superstars from Powerlifting America, and all eight of them qualified for the U.S. national team, headed to IPF Worlds in Malta in June. We talk about their outstanding performances and look ahead at how a stacked team USA might fare at Worlds. Before we start, don't forget that Powerlifting America has three more national competitions coming up with High School Nationals March 31st, University Nationals April 15th, and the grand finale, Age Group and Equipped Nationals on June 2nd. Thank you to SBD and Aleko for their continued partnership with Powerlifting America. If you're looking to compete in drug-tested powerlifting, whether you're just starting out or you want to compete with the best in the world, make sure you go to powerlifting-america.com, become a member, and follow us on Instagram at powerlifting underscore America. Now, let's get to this Sheffield recap with Heather and Julia. We're here with Heather Connor and Julia Williams, and we're going to do a little something of a recap show for the 2023 Sheffield Powerlifting Championships. So um, to start off with, how's it going, Heather and Julia? What's up? Going good. How are you? Going Doing good. good. Doing good. Julia, how are you feeling? Are you tired after this long week? Um, Julia works on our media team, and so she was doing a lot of work for us all week. How are you feeling today, the day, basically 24 hours after Sheffield? Yeah, I mean... I'm a little tired, um, but it's all still fresh in my head. So that that's good. <laughs> exactly. We're going to get this knowledge out of your head while it's still fresh and before you forget. Um, okay. So before we get started into the Sheffield recap, um, now that Sheffield is over, we've got breaking news. The U.S. national team has been completed. And I will just quickly run down who's made the team um, on both on the, the IPF world team as well as the NAPF team. So to start off with, we have Jessica Espinal in the 47 kilo class. We've got Heather Connor as a 47 as well. Natalie Richards, 57. Meg Scanlon in the 63s. Chelsea Savitt in the 69s. Dana McNeil in the 76. Amanda Lawrence in the 84. And Bonica Brown in the 84 plus. And that would leave the reserves as Claire Zai, Michelle Robbins, Megan Hurlbert, Christina Paraki, and Jamie Fisher in that order. Those are the reserves for the IPF Worlds team. Then for the NAPF team on the women's side, we have Jamie Fisher as a 52, Kate Cohen as a 52, Megan Hurlbert as a 57, Christina Paraki as a 57, Julia Williams, congratulations, as a 63, Claire Zai is a 69, Michelle Robbins is a 84, and Luella Bowden is, is a 84 plus. And the first reserves are Kelsey McCarthy, Elisa Tesler, Marisa Rulin, Tashel Kerr, and Erlena Morgan. Then on the men's side, so congratulations to all the women that have made it onto those national teams and all the reserves as well. On the men's side, um, for the IPF World Championship team, we have Waskar Carpio as a 59, Brian Lee, 66, Taylor Atwood as a 74, Delaney Wallace as an 83, Jonathan Kaiko as a 93, Gavin Aiden also a 93, Michael Davis, 105, and Jesus Oliveras as a 120 plus. The first alternate for that team will be Ray Williams, Dr. Ray Williams followed by Deuce Gruden, Sean Jen, Dalton LaCoe, and Tristan Nazelrod. So if we go to the NAPF team, which, by the way, this NAPF team is headed to the Cayman Islands, the, the team will be Dalton LaCoe as a 59, Jonathan Garcia as a 66, Deuce Gruden as a 83, Sean Jen as a 83, Bryce Lewis as a 93, Justin Rogers as a 105, Tristan Nazelrod as a 120, and Dr. Ray Williams as a 120+, plus, with the reserves being Mike T, Enrique Lugo, Jonathan Averill, David Berube and Gregory Johnson. So all that information, that's a lot of names, but congratulations to everyone who made a team or is on the reserves. Um, and, the, and the open team is going to be going, the open world IPF world championship team is going to be going to Malta and the NAPF team is going to be going to the Cayman Islands. So those are two awesome locations to go to. We'll get a post out with all this information and we'll get this information up on under the uh, national teams tab of the website as well here pretty soon but congratulations for making the team and heather you had already secured your spot on the team and i believe julia you had already actually secured your spot on the napf team going into sheffield so it didn't really change too much for you all but it did change things a little bit um especially on the men's side with all six of the men from sheffield making the team as well as bonica and amanda making the team so it shifted it by two on the women's side and shifted it by six on the men's side. So that's a pretty big shakeup on the men's side, but to be expected, you know, these are world champions and people that um, were invited to Sheffield are you know, the best of the best athletes in powerlifting. So it's to be expected that they would handle their business in Sheffield and check that box and do even more than that at Sheffield. 
um, this, which pretty much all of them went well above and beyond what the qualifying total was to make it on the U.S. national team. All right. So let's talk about what we're here for. Um, biggest meet in powerlifting history, biggest money meet in powerlifting history. I think the meet that will push the sport forward more than any other single event in the history of our sport. And that is the 2023 Sheffield powerlifting championships. Heather, just off the top, what was your overall takeaway, overall reaction to how well this meet was ran? Oh, it was wonderful. I mean, I knew Pete had everything up his sleeve to make sure that this competition, this big competition was going to be showcased and it was going to highlight so many of the strongest athletes in the world, right? And he wasn't just going to make it some local meat looking competition. Um, I mean, down to the media, down to, you know, the, the venue, all of it was just perfect. And so as, you know, SBD, SBD USA, Pete himself are putting up these stories, it kind of makes you feel like you're also there being able to see firsthand what's going on and kind of like what it took to make Sheffield what it is. And I really liked all the personable interviews that they had Um, because some of the questions like these lifters were getting, you know, kind of choked up answering some like what powerlifting meant to them. Um, and, you know, we're sitting here and we're watching these athletes just share their stories with us. So, you know, we can kind of relate to it a little bit. And I don't know, Pete did an awesome job. SVD did an awesome job. So the, the standard's really high now. He set that bar very, very high. So I'm pretty excited to see what would come from next year. Yeah, absolutely. You're talking about the road to Sheffield series um, in the lead up to Sheffield. Um, this like mini documentary films that they made on on most of the athletes. And it's just super, super cool. Give you a chance to get to know the athletes better. Really high, high production. Well done. And then, of course, leading into the meet, um, all the hype around this meet. Do you think it lived up to the expectations? I do. I do. And it's kind of one of those things like while you sit back and you're watching the athletes that were selected for this, whether it be the ones that won worlds or the wild cards or even Mo who came out of nowhere when Chance Mitchell unfortunately had to pull out the competition for whatever reason, um, Mo still showed up. Like he still made his presence known. And when I sit back and I look, I said, you know what? These are the athletes that were supposed to be there. Like every single one of them deserved to be there in their own way. And I think every one of them just showed up at the best that they could. Absolutely. All right. So Julia, what was your takeaway? Do you have any kind of like opening thoughts on Sheffield overall? Um, Not really. I I mean, I think um, I agree with Heather. I think it was uh, really well done. I think it really sets a new standard for um, what a powerlifting meet can and should be. Um, especially at the highest levels. And I hope that um, going forward, um, you know, we take that into account, whether it's worlds or or nationals or or anything, um, because um, this was a great way to highlight some lifters that, you know, really deserve a lot of recognition. And I think, um, you know, that was accomplished really well. Yeah, I mean, these are the superstars of our sport. And I think I've mentioned this on a previous episode that this is the first time I feel like they're really being treated like superstars, you know, put on a big stage with all the lights. I mean, they look like rock stars up there. I mean, with all the screens in the background and just the way the lighting was and the celebrations afterwards and stuff like this, like Delaney doing his dance moves and stuff like this. I mean, I just, it was, it was not just, um, a really high production, but it's like the athletes obviously were having fun with it too. You know, like they, they looked like they were really having a blast and like, like Jonathan Keiko, you don't really see him like celebrating and stuff too much. And he was celebrating after his lifts and things like this. So they did a good job of like making a huge production making them look like rock stars and all of this, but also still making them feel comfortable enough that they weren't like stressed out. Like they were, it looked like at least that they were, they were having fun in the moment and enjoying being on that big stage in front of all those people. I will say it looked fun. Like they were enjoying themselves until like deadlifts came around. And then I think people were tired. <laughs> yeah. Like the, ex- the expressions on the, the face, like just started to change. Like I look into facial expressions all the time. Um, so I think especially for like the Americans with the time difference and stuff like that, like some, some of them were probably just like, man, I am sleepy. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> and especially probably from from the people from New Zealand, like Carlina and and Evie. I mean, like, they were probably like yeah, really tired. Eight p.m. East Eastern time. I was like, holy mm-hmm. crap! This the guys haven't even went yet. So I mean, if there was one thing I could change, it would probably be the start time. Mm-hmm. But I mean, I, I mean, at this at, at a competition like that, you ain't gonna please everybody. Yeah, so I'm not gonna say you know what you should please the Americans because you know what there's also other people that are traveling farther than us and having that more different of a time change so i mean i guess in their defense they're probably picking a time that they felt met everybody's needs yeah i mean like it it, for us julie and i on the on the uh we were we had a zoom call where we were you know doing our thing for pa social media and stuff like this but it was like 9 a.m start so in the u.s like that's not too bad you know like like for the americans at least it was like still daytime hours when they were competing um but you know having been there for three four days and then getting you know all all the media stuff that they were doing all the hype and adrenaline probably pumping you know in days leading up to it they probably were starting to get a little tired it definitely seemed like after the event um just based on what i saw on social media and everything that like people pretty much went to bed (laughs) Well, yeah. And you know, with a meet like that, where it's not an aggressive amount of people, I mean, it's two flights. Yeah. You're going to get burned out pretty quickly. So, you know, it's a, we're probably just tired with how fast it went. For sure. For sure. Okay. So let's get into the results and uh, let's talk about it a little bit. Let's go. um, Let's talk about the women's side of the competition first and kind of things that stood out to you. Um, key performances, you know, we definitely focus on the Americans, but we'll also talk about, you know, all these other amazing lifters from around the world, even though this is a power of the America podcast, we're fans of the sport. And these are all our brothers and sisters in the IPF. So, you know, congrats and hats off to all of them, even if they're not from the US. But go ahead, Heather, what do you say? Uh-oh. Well, not everybody is my brother and sister. <laughs> <laughs> well, you don't have to, you don't have to like your brothers and sisters. You're stuck with them though. I, uh, yeah, I am. Um, oh. So I'll just, you know, I did want to highlight because this was one of the first things I talked about. Um, and then I'll get to the Americans because yeah. there's no way you can just neglect their performances. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think the just okay I was going to say something but then the other part jumped in my head so obviously the first surprise to me was Evie Corrigan coming from the 57 kilo class down to the 52 like uh challenging Nomi Albert like Nomi has just ran the 52 kilo class for a few years now and at some point I'm like man she cannot be touched and then surprise and the first thing I did was message my coach. Actually, I trolled my coach and I'm like, Tedrick, why didn't you have any, you know, like I, I want to know this, but I wouldn't have told anybody except for like five people, but who are they going to tell, you know? Um, so that was like the big shock, but it also got me more excited because of here's the showdown that I know was going to happen. But then I'm like, okay, well, what about the weight cut? You know, yeah. it's going to affect her. But then when you see her openers, I'm like, okay, maybe, maybe not. Um, so that was the surprise. Um, and then Evie, I think, well, hold on real quick before we move from Evie. Um, I'm just like pulling a, her up on open powerlifting and stuff. Um, yeah, she's, she's totaled into the four sixties a bunch of times at 57. Mm-hmm. Um, and so for her to then drop all the way down to 52 and still total four sixty on the dot. I mean, that is a real Testament to Kedrick. Uh, is he the one that helps her help her make that big weight cut. Yeah. I mean, to be able to drop down a weight class and maintain all of that strength, that is really huge. The other thing about Evie yeah, she just, uh, compete. I mean, she did compete in New Zealand in the Commonwealth championships and did a 468 just in November, like late November, basically December, you know, very late the end of November. So, and for that meet, she was weighing 55.9. So there's really pretty much no sign that she was going to be dropping down and cutting all the way down to 52 for this meet and then maintaining that strength hats off to her. Yeah. That's huge. Um, I personally haven't seen a ton of her training feels, so feels like she kind of came out of the shadows a little bit. Um, but I mean, she's, she's awesome. And, uh, you know, Rory and the New Zealand people are always talking about how they're always picking her to win and stuff like this. And, she finally, you know, she lived up to it and they had a, a good reason to pick her to win this one because she blew the world record total out of the water. 
Yeah, I kind of wanted to run through a wall when I saw that um, because my adrenaline was high. And then Joy from Great Britain came out to squat wearing not just a belt, but knee sleeves. Oh, hello. Like she, I think shocked everybody because she is one that doesn't wear anything. Mm -hmm. So that was already like a surprise to the universe. Like Joy wearing a belt, wearing knee sleeves, like. You, you know, and it did help her squat. It did. Um, you, good. Her and Chandler Babb kind of have the same squat when she is like beltless and sleeveless, um, you know, and it just worked for them. Um, but with that belt, with those knee sleeves, I do think it did benefit her a little bit. So we probably will see a lot of that in the future. But I mean, sure enough, deadlifts come around and there she is mm-hmm. um, beltless again. Again, it works for her. And yeah. then um I don't want to, I'm going to mispronounce her name, even though I heard it a million times yesterday. I've always called her Jade. Um, uh-huh. France. um, so I apologize for the mispronunciation of that, but you know, we already knew that was going to be head to head. Yeah. And her to just come out on top like that was also very amazing. But my two favorites, of course, Benika Brown, Amanda Lawrence, obviously yeah. I'm, I'm a little bit biased you know, being with Team USA, but um, Benika, you know, topping Amanda just a little bit, not because of performance, but I think because I am a little bit closer to Benika. And so her and I do share uh, stories back and forth pretty frequently. So leading up to this competition, you know, she spoke to me a lot about personal things and kind of what she was experiencing and, you know, how social media is just doing social media things, like it just drives you crazy at times. Mm -hmm. So for her to um come out to Sheffield and put on the performance that she did where honestly there was a lot there the world record squat she sandbagged the bench and I know why and then that third deadlift you know coming back from world games where her last deadlift was overturned and still for reasons that blow my mind to where it took the world game overall winner from her yeah back and get all three deadlifts yep it was just insanity to me. And it made me so happy. Like I cried for Panika a few times because if there was anybody that deserved an amazing performance, like it was her. And I'm so proud of her. Um, so she, she deserves, she deserves like all this recognition from me right now. And, and, and real quick on, on her, I mean, she totaled 680, which is a huge total. I mean, her, her total before at worlds, um, this year, in the raw total was 668.5. So, I mean, she's putting on something that's, that's a huge addition to her total, like 12 and a half kilos on a world record total that she's consistently pushed up over decades, you know, she's um, also so, one that does post a lot. So it's yeah. kind of like, we get like kind of glimpses of what she's doing and we get those glimpses when somebody's made her mad, like yeah. somebody has been in her ear too much. And I kind of like that. Maybe I should start getting her ear. And then you'll see me in the comment section, all oh, post the this, 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 you know, just, yeah. you know, people don't know if I'm fibbing or like, is it real? And then you see her performance are like, God, what is, was Heather telling the truth? Was this happening behind the scenes? Because she made that squat. Oh gosh, there was kilos left behind on that one. Oh, totally. Totally. And like you said, the comeback, uh, the the deadlift story too, because she missed her third deadlift at IPF World. She missed her, she got her third deadlift overturned at World Games. So, you know, hats off to Bonica. And she told us on the podcast, you know, in advance leading into this, that she was, she was, her training was going well and she was ready to break that world record. And um, she, wa- she wanted to break it at IPF Worlds in South Africa, but she held off. And so she, you know, she did it and she broke it by a good percentage um she broke it by 100 she she finished with 101.3 percent of the world record which finished her in fifth place and in that fifth place she took the prize for nine thousand pounds and julia do you have uh the info on like her how much that is in dollars that she ultimately took away yeah so that was about eleven thousand dollars about 11,000. And that includes her, um, because she also broke the world record squat. So I think that in the end, she took something like 14,000 pounds. I will say this, um, for Benika, she was only two and a half kilos 
off from placing third overall at Sheffield. And this was from conversations that we obviously had this morning. And she said it was so hard trying to math so fast. And so you know how fast it must have been going like as a competitor and as a handler, because all of a sudden you turn around, you're going right back out there. Um, so, you know, it's, you always want to make sure that you have the right people by your side. And I mean, two and a half kilos for okay. third overall, that's a big chunk of money right there. But yeah. regardless, I know that two and a half kilos was there, whether definitely on bench, um, definitely could have been there on squat and definitely could have been there on deadlift. Um, so, you know, I know she's proud of her performance. I'm super proud. And I think she has kind of like silenced some people who might've been questioning her. Oh yeah. You know, I do know Benika has some, um, challengers coming at her, um, mm -hmm. and also, but you know what, that's what we want from the sport. We want people to challenge you, right? 100%. Uh, so Anita from Belgium, you know, she's, she's ready. She wants to go after Benika. I want her to go after Benika. Because you know what? I think that's when we're going to see Benika at her strongest is when somebody is trying to push her to be that strongest. So, so real bottom. quick, real quick, Sonita, she's totaled 660 um, before. And like we said, Bonika just threw down a, a 680 with definite room to maneuver on her squat, which is already at the world record. I think her deadlift is right there at world record level as well. I mean, it's getting oh, yeah. close. And then, and then, like you said, her, she held back a little bit on bench. Um, so that's going to be fun. And it's fun to see Bonica fired up. Like I know she was, you know, em emotionally injured by that, what happened to her at the world games. And it took time for her to come back from that. And th there's no doubt that that lit a fire under her for as well. You know, she's the kind of person that takes those kind of adversity and turns it into fuel for her own fire. And so now seeing like, okay, she's kind of the world has been put on notice that Bonica Brown is still here and she's still crushing and she's still putting up world record PR totals. And now, you know, the next thing will be if Sonita is going to be a legit challenge, I think we're going to see Bonica rise to the occasion. That's right. Um, same thing could be said. Well, ow, wait, let me, let me backtrack real quick. I almost said the same thing could be said about Amanda Lawrence. Psych. Uh -huh. Um, because who's about to stop Amanda Lawrence? Yeah, there's no <laughs> like, Sonita. There's no uh, Sonita waiting wait in the wings. But real quick, yeah. before we move on from from Bonica, um, I misspoke earlier because uh, I'm reading I'm reading off of the powerlifting uh, powerliftingdata.com Instagram account where they have the all of the world records and all the information. So finishing in fifth place, Bonica got four thousand pounds for that, and then she got five thousand pounds for breaking the world record squat which brings the total to 9,000 pounds. And Julia was correct in saying that that converts to around 11 grand. Maybe so Julia, you got to jump in and correct me when I say wrong things. <laughs> Cause I know, you know, <laughs> but yeah. Okay. Go ahead, Heather. Uh, or unless, unless Julia, did you, do you want to say anything about um, Bonica before we move on from her? Um, yeah. I mean, I just, you know, to echo what Heather was saying, um, her, her comeback from world games was phenomenal. Um, you know, she's, she's the best in her weight class, you know, undisputed until maybe worlds, we don't know, but, um, you know, and she's been there for a very, very long time. And um, it was just great to see her go nine for nine. I think her, her third squat was like one of the most impressive lifts I've ever seen, like uh, 280 kilos raw. That's, I mean, that's phenomenal. Yeah, exactly. Uh, 280, 617 pounds for people in the U S um, an absolutely ridiculous, huge squat with that. We could all only dream of ever even getting close to that. Um, but uh, amazing. In, in, anything else you want to add, Julia? Um, no, I think. Okay. Heather all said right, it. So let's kick it back over to Heather. Then any final thoughts on Bonica and just this amazing performance? Um, I just love her so much and I'm your number one fan and I can't wait to see you in Malta. <laughs> Absolutely. And shout out, Bonica made me this shirt and she made yeah. all this, these shirts for Team USA last year. So what an awesome person. We couldn't be happier for you. And everyone that's in her corner, you know, um, 
because like she mentioned on the podcast that it takes she gave she shouted out like 20 people's names on the podcast you go back and listen to her Sheffield check-in if you haven't but you know she mentioned that it wouldn't be she wouldn't be the champion that she is if it wasn't for all the people around her she's very humble um in, yeah. in mentioning that so all right and then you were going to start to say something about Amanda Lawrence before before I cut you off go oh, ahead I was about to start with a lie and say that Amanda Lawrence actually had somebody on her heels but uh no. Um, so we can only talk about how great not only did she did it do at Sheffield, but we can only hope to see an even stronger version of Amanda come Malta. Uh, so as we spoke previously before we started recording, Amanda set the world record total back in Sweden in 2021. Um, and she, like I mentioned, she was kind of like struggling through some like injuries, some little pesky things that kind of held her back some. Um, and then not being able to one, take that world record total um, back in South Africa. Mm -hmm. And then two, finishing second place to Tiffany Chapon, who, you know, that was going to be Amanda's three peak for best overall female lifter. Yeah. Uh, and there's a reason why I'm bringing this up because. Um, as it was mentioned on social media before, and it was very well written while Amanda did not place top three in Sheffield due to how they were doing the placings, she still had a phenomenal performance breaking and breaking and breaking world record after world record, putting her back on top of that list or very close near to it. One yeah. of these strongest pound for pound women in this sport. So we can't just let you know, the placings and how it was all scored take away from this performance that she had, because, you know, you see the top three and you want to, you're proud of them. Obviously I'm proud of them, but we also got to look at the finer details. I mean, Amanda took home 15, what, 15,000 pounds. That means she 16. 16. So she already made more than second place, uh, regardless but that was how many world records she was breaking. She yeah. broke that world record squat, which, you know, after her second, I was pretty curious about what that third was about to be. And yeah. for, she came out and she crushed it again, wanted to run through a wall because it, that was, that was a strong squat. So she so, broke it. She broke the squat world record on her second. Yes. Which was correct? a big jump. It was a big jump. You know, I was very surprised at how big that jump was. So after seeing how the second moved, I wondered if it was too big of a jump and how that would affect her third. But they did make the appropriate jump to the third. And honestly, I don't think she had a kilo left in her, though. I'm, I think it moved a little bit better than the second. Right. That's because we we were all on a Zoom call, you know, watching right. and everything. And we were talking about this and we we saw her second. Like you said, she went from 230 to 244 which, yeah. you know, a 14 kilo jump is like, you know, that's like 35 pounds. That's a pretty big, pretty big jump. And right. it looked like it was work on that second attempt. And then she came out and we were nervous that even another two and a half or yeah, she basically did another two and a half on her to go up to 246.5 on her third. And we were nervous that she might miss that and it might drain her and it might, you know, lead her down this path of like having a bad day, like maybe missing a deadlift or something later. Cause you know, you miss a third squat, you're going to probably miss a, a third deadlift. Shout out Matt Gary. Um, but, uh, you know, she came out and moved it even right. better than, than her, her second. I mean, it looked, it looked even better. So yeah, it was, it was an amazing. And maybe that's because it was such a big jump that second one, maybe that's why it moved a little slow. That's right. And um, I always say that, that sometimes those smaller jumps kind of get us a little bit more than the bigger jumps do. And maybe she trains making bigger jumps in you know training. I don't know because I'm not there. So I'm only speaking by what I'm currently seeing in present day. Um, but for me and a few other people, that's probably a significant jump. But she did secure that world record on the second and then rebroke it on the third. So congratulations to her on that world record squat um, bench. I think she played a little bit conservative there too. Um, because I, you know, when you know you got a your best lift about to come up, I mean, respectfully, she's great at squats too, but you want to conserve as much energy as you have left. Um, and sure enough, here come deadlifts. And that second, it moved. And I was like, 
uh, oh, but I knew, I knew not only does she want to take back her world record deadlift, her world record total, but I know that she also wanted to take back the strongest female deadlifter in the world. I know yep. she, yep. and sure enough, she came out for that third and rightfully so. What was it? 692 pounds. Yeah. 268. I mean, yeah. She broke the world record with 261 on her second and then went up to 268.5 on her, on her third, which is 591.1. Oh, I said 690. Damn near 600 pounds though. Like she's knocking yeah. on the door of 600. And, and I know she told That's me in I advance, <laughs> she told me in advance, like, you know, she's ready to pull 600 any day. I mean, yeah, she's right I, there. I don't, I don't see 600 being too far off. Exactly. Right? You know, it's, it's kind of easy for us to sit back and say like, what's another nine pounds. It's a lot. It's a lot, but come June, I think she will have it. I do, especially for training, it's going to continue to go as well as it has from, again, my perspective and, you know, social media, you only get to see what people choose to post. So, yeah. I can and again, it. it's, it's, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, you're fine. Silly zoom here. Um, but this, uh, just, just looking at like, again, she's a, an athlete that faced adversity at Worlds. You know, she didn't, uh, she won by a ton, uh, you know, she like handily became a three-time world champion, which is amazing, but her goal was to win best lifter. And she was trying to three-peat something that no one's ever done before. And no doubt it left a bad taste in her mouth because, you know, she got, she got called on technicalities on her bench that pretty much made the difference. And there's no question, just like Bonica, that it hurt her, but it also led lit a fire under her leading into her training and her training has been absolutely on fire. And again, keep plugging the podcast, like listen to the way she was talking on the check-in that we did like 12 days out from Sheffield. She was so fired up, so confident, just, just like the Amanda that you always want to see, like super confident, healthy, feeling great in high spirits, all those kind of things, like ready to just crush it. And she, and she did. And I mean, we're talking about, she's just a, a hair away from 600 pound deadlift, but again, you have to think she broke the squat world record twice and mm -hmm. broke the deadlift world record before she did that. So yeah. maybe if she made one big jump straight to 600, she could have, she could have pulled 600 or something like that, but to play the cards safe and break those world records and collect those checks you know, she did a lot of heavy work. Imagine you don't have to do that when you're going to worlds, you don't right. have to break the world record multiple times. So she could, you know, um, we could be in for an even bigger performance than her. And also just to mention 645 kilos was her total, her previous, which is a world record. Her previous world record was 636.5. So again, she pretty much shattered her own world record that ends up coming out to 101.3% of the world record, but you just think about putting eight and a half, nine kilos, whatever that is, whatever the math is on that, on a world record that you've already put up there a couple of times. Like she did it in 2019 with against Danny. She did it again, in 2021 in Sweden. This is a world record that's been pushed up consistently. So to break it by eight and a half kilos is a huge deal. It's a very big deal. And then we'll just mention, <clears throat> if we look at, if we look at the results, of Sheffield by other metrics. Okay. So like we want to stir the pot here. We look at it based on IPF good lift points, Amanda head and shoulders above everyone winning with a 122.15 good lift points. The next best after that would have been TIFF at 119.5. So a full like three points, uh, roughly, you know, a three point win uh, on good lift points. And just for reference, Tiff won best lifter at IPF worlds with a 118.47 good lift points. So if Amanda had put up a performance like this at worlds, she would have handily won best lifter at worlds and three peated for sure. So, um, had, I mean, amazing performance to Amanda. And then if we want to also sort, let me just sort this out real quick by dots, because I think a lot of people think that dots is one of the better uh, coefficient scores to use. Obviously we're biased at power of team America with IPF points, but dots is a pretty good metric. And uh, she had a 595 dots, which was the highest again, by far of anyone at Sheffield 595. Hey, Zeus came in second. And if you were ranking it by dots um, with a 592.5, 
and then Jade coming in as the second uh, highest female with a 580. So 580 versus 595 for Amanda. Um, so when we think about like the just pound for pound, the strongest performance, best performance at the event, Amanda is arguably right there um, at the top with with Evie and everyone else that had amazing performance, not to take anything away from them breaking the world records and, and whatnot. But if we look at some of these other metrics, Amanda is like a clear, clear favorite. Right. So. And again, and it's one of those things to where we have to respect how they choose to run the competition, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they knew going into the competition how it was going to be scored. So at the end of the day, you got to give your high fives. You got to congratulate the winners um, because they won based off the rules. Um, so, but that's when it comes time for Malta, when you're then going back to the rules that she's really, really strong at, yeah. you know, could we see Amanda Lawrence come back and snatch that best overall female lifter award again? I think yeah. it's going to be very tight. And, you know, I don't think a lot of people realize once you reach a certain point in this sport, it's hard to just keep re-breaking these things. And I think a lot of people just think it's so easy. It's yeah. not like it's even not. with, you know, uh, Tiffany Chapone, who plays second based off of points under Amanda, you know, she still only totaled one kilo for her best. So mm -hmm. I think people, you know, just think like all oh, these lifters had a bad day, but at the same time, these lifters are just pushing themselves to their absolute best. And that's not easy. It's yeah. not easy to continuously break these very high end totals. You know, with Carlina setting the the 76 world record total so high at the Commonwealth, yeah. I wondered, well, how is this going to go? You know, how yeah. are they possibly going to break this? Because again, that standard was set. And, you know, I got a missing like her first two benches. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> it was so anxiety inducing. I couldn't even watch. I was just like, you know, praying for her that she would get that third. Yeah. I mean, you never want anybody to bomb out. And um, Eddie Berglund did the same thing. I know we haven't got to the men's yet, but yeah, yeah. it's when you are such accustomed to the old bench rules and how you're used to benching for years. Um, you know, it might, that, that's something that you have to proactively practice because yeah. once you get to competitions with this standard, they are going to make it very difficult for you to just, okay, here's a, a white light because, you know, as you've seen on social media before, if social media thinks it's high, well, you know, uh, just turn off your comments because you <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> you're not going to hear the end of that one, but they came back. They both got it. So good. And, and just to say something about the 76 is like you mentioned, Carlina had pushed that world record up, you know, so high at Commonwealth's um, that it was going to be a tall order for those three to make it in, in, you know, break that world record that had ju just been broken so recently and pushed it so high. It was going to be a tall order for them to finish well in the placing here. But if we rank again by dots, Carlina finished fourth on dots, yeah. you know what I mean? So, I mean, again, like, even though she didn't break the world record total that she had put up before, which was massive, just getting close to that world record total, which, um, you know, she came up at 98.9% of her own world record total, just getting close to that world record is a huge performance when we look at just overall strength pound for pound and the type of performance that that was. So and just so we're clear on the, you know, how women were pushing themselves in this competition, like Chandler Babb went for her third deadlift, ended up passing mm -hmm. out. That was scary. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, and then Jessica going for her third deadlift attempt, you know, also kind of got lightheaded. So it's again, like these people are pushing themselves to, you know, to their absolute most and it's still at 98 percent of the world record so it's not an easy feat it's not it's not easy to get to this point and then no. say oh i can just re-break this again because it no if it was that easy there'd be a lot more world records broken that day 
Well, and I mean, again, shout out Matt Gary had a post about this, like, you know, a couple of weeks before Sheffield talking about how hard it is to break a world record total and how rarely it's ever been done. I think Bonica is the only one who has ever done it four times now, five times. Um, and b below that, it's like a handful of people have done it three times and maybe a, another, you know, handful have done it two times. Yesterday on the women's side on, at Sheffield, we saw eight world record totals be broken. Eight. Eight out of 12. I mean, that, and then, and then of course, we had a bunch of people getting super close to in the 76, like Carlina came in right at 98.9. So the women yesterday, I mean, just talk about like this amazing performance. Like we saw again, eight world record totals. It looks like one, two, three, four, five, six squat world records fell. Um, it looks like Agatha, you know, got the bench world record and then three deadlift world records fell as well. And all of that happened while, if you look at the, if you look at the board on lifting cast, there's quite a bit of red in here. I mean, there's a lot of missed lifts going on, you know, um, because people were pushing themselves to the max, but even despite a bunch of missed lifts, uh, pushing for world records and things like this, eight world record totals were broken in one day. That is crazy. It is. And again, it's just set in standard a little bit higher going to worlds. I mean, if you are somebody that's going into worlds and you weren't watching, which let's be honest, if you say you weren't, you're lying or you were working and being an adult is, you know, either yeah. or, um, but we all know you're watching at work. So it doesn't matter. Um, you know, <laughs> what you need to do going into Malta, right? Like, you know, okay, this person just did this. Holy crap. Yeah. So, I mean, I'd be lying if I said me and Jess weren't texting back and forth about, you know, double teaming the 47 going in there, like double yeah. trouble. We've Absolutely. got a plan. You know, I got her back. She's got mine. And we know exactly what we need to do uh, to make sure Team USA both podiums. So, yep, yep. Absolutely. And okay. So, wrapping up, uh, Julia, you have anything that you want to add on the women's side? Um, well, yeah, I've, I've, I've quite a bit, um, Go ahead. I, uh, a lot of it, um, Heather got to, but, you know, obviously the highlight for me was Bonica's third squat. Um, but I think as well, like the second lift that I would have, um, said really stuck out to me was, um, Amanda's third deadlift and actually her second as well. Um, because I remember when we were in the, the zoom call and when this was happening and she did 242 and it looked good um and then she loaded 261 for the world record and I said you know I don't know if this is the move like that's a huge jump and she nailed it and mm -hmm. then she put in 280 um originally as her third and that was just wild like <laughs> you were like oh my god <laughs> what's about to happen here yeah, but I mean, I, I do think that, um, you know, she will hit 280. She will hit a 280 deadlift. It's just a matter of when. And um, yeah, crazy to see her back the way she is. So. Yeah, yeah. And then finally hitting that 268.5 um, for her third. They pulled that that number down and it looked like that was about the right number yeah. um, as far as how much gas she might have had left in the tank. Again, like two world record squats and a world record deadlift already. I do think she's good. I mean, she's, she's, she's mentioned some things in the DM. She's good for a lot more. I can tell you that, but it, it would require the right jumps, you know, not taking multiple world record attempts. But, um, one thing I want to mention about the women's and, and Julia, you actually pointed this out on your Instagram story was mm -hmm. just the winner. Evie Corrigan went nine for nine and the two Americans, Amanda and Bonica both went nine for nine. And that was it. Nobody else in the meet went nine for nine. So hats off to those three lifters performing at the highest standard, you know, the highest level showing that consistency. And it really is truly a feat to go nine for nine and to also do it on the biggest stage. And it just shows like what kind of competitors these people are. And, and of course, Evie won it with a, you know, by a lot with a 105% of the world record. And we already talked about how Amanda put up, you know, it, uh, so just checking on again, on open power thing. According to dots and good lift points, things like this, second greatest performance ever by a woman um, in raw uh, tested federations. 
Um, only Leah, and it's barely, only Leah has ever made, uh, put up a performance as strong as what Amanda did yesterday. So very cool. And of course, how do you do that? Go nine for nine, and you're going to put up a performance like that. So really cool Unless to see that. The internet, and then the only way is steroids. What's that? <laughs> Unless you ask the internet? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, all, it's only steroids. And, and we know that's not the case with these lifters because you know, Heather, firsthand how serious the WADA testing pool is. I mean, they will come to your house. They don't care what you're doing. And I mean, we saw it yesterday. Jonathan Geico is getting tested while holding up the entire show for the awards. Yeah, let's just go ahead and jump into the men's and say yeah. that was one of my annoyances. Like, why? Mm -hmm. Why would you, y'all know that awards are about to happen. Why would you not just wait? <laughs> exactly. Why wouldn't you just wait? And, and I mean, why wouldn't you just watch them on the stage? Yeah. I mean, obviously like once you, uh, for those that don't know, like once you have been advised that you are being drug tested, that dope and control officer cannot leave. Like they got to see you at all times. So what he meant by like, he could watch you while, you know, Jonathan K goes on stage Absolutely. But then as soon as Jonathan Keiko gets off, that dope and control officer would then have to follow him to make sure that nothing silly goofy is going on, which I mean, let's be honest, when you're at Sheffield and the IPA president, the PA president and like SPG yeah. owner himself is there, we're probably not going to do anything goofy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, that so, yeah. <laughs> so you guys want to jump into the, uh, on, go to the men's side then. Sure. Sure. All right. So what was your like kind of top level takeaways? I mean, obviously <laughs> go Have ahead. You heard of that one lifter, I, his name's kind of like Jesus. Have you ever heard of him? Yeah, I heard of him. I heard of him. He did something if pretty it, special. Yeah, happened, well, you are about to now because holy crap performance of like the universe. Yes. Pound for pound, strongest, the highest total of any male lifter tested, non-tested in the world. Y'all hear me? Not just the U.S. Like he is the strongest walking man yep. in the world in the sport of powerlifting. Like, and holy crap, not only did he get that. But there was a lot left. I don't know what happened with his third attempt that left. Maybe the maybe they were just a little bit sleepy. I don't know. I didn't see anything wrong. And I'm glad that whoever it was zoomed across the camera, ran to the jury table and had it overturned because Grant he, Iverson, he, Grant Iverson, hello, American Grant. hero. <laughs> Grant, hello. Um, you, my friend, are the handler of the year. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> because like we were all kind of like what in the world and there might have been some like mobs outside of Sheffield had that not got overturned because if you can give me a reason why it was overturned and I'm sure when I see these referees they'll tell me and I'll just tell them they're wrong um then I'll be like all right but nothing makes logical sense that was a great deadlift and maybe it was just so fast they were confused yes yeah and, and to nail your point here, um, if you just go to open powerlifting, which by the way, everyone, including myself needs to go out and become a Patreon of open powerlifting. I think that's how you do it is, is by through Patreon. Is that right, Heather? Um, I'll, I'll remember to put the link to, to do that in our, all of our YouTube videos, you know, for now on, um, because we rely on that so much, but if you go and you just search by, you just sort by total. Now Jesus has the third highest total ever. Um, and he has in the only two people that have higher total. So, so he totaled 1152.5. The only two people that have ever totaled more than him ever in any, they're both did it in wraps, which for people who don't know is basically like a special type of equipment that helps you get more out of your squat on, on squats. And they also did it in untested federations. Um, so we'll leave that, you know, the speculation as to what that might be with there. We don't want to accuse people of anything, but they did it on tested feds and they did it with reps. And I think Jesus is going to ultimately come for their numbers and have the highest total ever by anyone period, no matter what kind of equipment you use. 
um, whether you use wraps or knee sleeves and whether you are tested or not tested. Go ahead, Heather. What do you, you see? Like you're going to say something. <laughs> Go ahead. I like how powerlifting America doesn't want to assume that anybody's on steroids, but the second any of us get on steroids. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> but I, hey, I mean, if you go to Jesus's TikTok, like all these little kids, like there's no way you're doing it natural. Like bro has stopped defending himself because of why. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. um there's no point like once you hear it so many times it's just like another comment that's just being made um but phenomenal performance uh kudos to the spotters and loaders because when he bobbled at the top of that third squat i'm gonna be real honest with you i would have left because ain't no way <laughs> if he fails like for real like i would have just i don't know I would have just dumped somewhere. So never have me be a spotter or loader. <laughs> no, I think there's a height requirement. Like a there. thousand pound squat. That's like 10 Heathers. Okay. So, <laughs> um, you know, like unreal. And the way it moved, again, it bobbled at the top, but the explosiveness out the hole with a thousand pounds on your back is just insane to me. Like my body yeah. is breaking just thinking about it. Going on to bench, I explained this to my sister this morning who just knows me in powerlifting and thinks I'm strong. And then I told her like, Hey, here's this guy doing a thousand over a thousand pounds in squat, 600 pounds in bench, and then over 900 pounds in deadlift. That sounds like a fever dream to me. Like, it's just unheard of. It's unreal. Like it can't be true. And he's doing it with ease. He's doing it with kilos left in the tank. So by the time Malta comes around, my gosh. Yeah. Untouched. What is he going to be on at that point, <laughs> right? in his own little category, the Jesus category. And there's only room for one of them, and it's him. Um, he is him. Yes. And we stand. We love Jesus. <laughs> so real quick before we, you know, talk about anything else, he, he did 425 uh, on his opener on squat, 455, and then 470. and just real quick, if I'm looking at the, whether those are world records or not, those, none of those are world records. Um, because Ray Williams, you know, has set the bar so high with this squat, but he did do something that only a handful of people have ever done before in their lives. And that is he squatted a thousand pounds. So that second attempt is a thousand and three. And then his, his third attempt, a thousand and thirty six pounds. So he squatted over a thousand pounds two times yesterday. That is absolutely ridiculous. And of course, yes, Ray has done 1,080 pounds. Ray is amazing. You know, we can't give Dr. Ray Williams enough respect for the numbers that he's put up there, but wow. Jesus squatting over a thousand pounds twice in a day and twice in one meet. I mean, this is just like the, the greatest squatting I've ever seen live, you know? Um, so I think he the world record total. What was it on his second deadlift? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, oh, I think. It, or was it the first? I think, I think it, was it was his opener. First. Yeah, it was his opener. Yeah, it was his opener. Um, because I think after his third bench, it set him up to be able to out total the world record total on his opening deadlift. Yes. Yeah, it says. Yeah, wow. yeah, it was his opening for sure. I mean, and again, like his third attempt moved so dang fast um you blinked you missed it so i'm pretty curious as to what we're going to see next from him because it's already unreal so if i mean if there's gonna be one guy to watch one super heavyweight guy of course i i do i do love my super heavyweights they're all really big teddy bears yeah. um, you know but jesus he's just i mean one of a kind honestly. And the sky's the limit. I mean, if you saw the way his squats moved, I mean, the only, the only thing that can, you know, hamper his total is are the referees. That's the only thing. I mean, the strength, as far as the strength is concerned, um, he's definitely got more in the tank and he's getting stronger. He's young. He's like 25, you know? So, I mean, uh, I think that's right. I don't want to misquote. Well, he didn't have the performance he wanted. And 24, 24, 24, 24, and yeah. he's doing these numbers and he's, I mean, his, he's fired up in training. He's got a good coach, his programming, everything is going good, you know? So we'll see the future is extremely bright for him.
Go ahead. And he was a wild card. Let's let's not forget that. He was a wild card going into, and of course he was one of the favorites to be selected as a wild card, but um, you know, he didn't have the performance he wanted in Sun City, South Africa. So exactly. like you said before with Amanda and Benika, it kind of probably lit a fire underneath them. So yeah. the same applies to him because his training just was a lot more composed. You know, he had again mm-hmm. you saw that fire in his training like you yeah. wanted to watch his training because it was all going so well leading up to this competition and i think we've been waiting for this jesus performance and the only thing that could go against him were referees at this point but squat depth was on point oh. like you couldn't dispute it there's no he way to say like uh maybe it was there but um you know just phenomenal squat bench deadlift mm-hmm. he did let go of that opening deadlift a little early um, the right hand, it looked like came off. Cause you know, he's used to throwing it down yeah. in training. That's the only thing is like, man, just make sure he can't get called on any kind of technicalities. Cause we know how they treat like Bonica talked about, you know, super heavies face very strict standards at IPF worlds. And that's really the only thing now he doesn't really have anyone challenging him at IPF worlds. And so uh, it was kind of cool to see like at this, the format for this meet with the money on the line and all of this it kind of really pushed him and enabled him to just go all out, you know? And I know, like you said, IPF worlds in South Africa, he got some bad calls or questionable calls. And then he also was injured going into that as well. So I know that he didn't have the performance. Um, and so of course hats off to SBD for having the system, the selection process to get him into Sheffield, you know, leaving that wiggle room there with those wild card spots to do the obvious right thing and have Jesus Oliveris there, you know, was, was amazing. And thank God they did. And also we'll just mention too, Evie comes from uh, one of the wild card selections as well, or the secondary selections from the regions, you know, which a lot of people are like, why do we have this, this regional selection thing or whatever? Well, here you go. She won the women's uh, category by a considerable amount coming out of the, that regional selection criteria. So amazing. Um, and it, it just Jesus's performance like we can't talk about it enough. He went nine for nine. He you know put up the third biggest total ever, um, and he put up a bigger total by a considerable amount than Ray's best. You know Ray's best total eleven twelve point five. Jesus now eleven fifty two point five fifty two. He put forty kilos on Ray's best. That's insanity. I mean, no one could have ever imagined that that would happen like in our lifetimes, probably. We thought maybe that record could get chipped, but. Yeah, like if you go back to uh, USAPL Nationals in Atlanta, Georgia, when Ray first squatted over a thousand pounds, you would never like, having somebody say, hey, have you heard of Jesus? Everybody would look at you like you're crazy, yeah. right? Like, cause it's just not fathomable that somebody like Ray could have came about. And here we are somebody has surpassed Ray Williams, who is iconically well-known and one respectfully so one of the goats of powerlifting, right? I don't throw that term around a lot, but, you know, well-deserved. So to have somebody just come out and say, watch this. Yeah. Hold my beer. Yeah. And you know, it is just amazing. And it's also like, while Jesus is standing up on the podium, it's also good to see Jonathan Keiko, Gavin Aiden, all. Yep. So Powerlift America kind of took over the men's side, right? Two ninety threes up there. Um, you know, um, going, just transferring right into that. Gavin Aiden missed his third squat, uh, which was a world record. It got overturned. Uh, mm-hmm. Well, he got it and then it was overturned. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know why it could not be disputed, um, but they kind of just sent the handler on their way. Um, so they they said it was high. Um, from my point of view, it, it did look kind of high. It wasn't nearly as deep as he normally would go. Um, but again, it all depends on like what the referee is seeing at the time. Um, so I can only imagine how it must have felt to be told that you have this world record and then it get taken right away from you. Uh, yeah. So, you know, still to come back and still have the performance that he did again, his third deadlift. Hello. Yeah. Did he forget to add weight to the bar because it moved like a good opener second attempt. 
Yeah. Yeah. 340. He left, he left some kilos on that for sure. As far as uh, temp selection went on that. And I mean, maybe you miss, you, you try to hit a world record squat and you miss on a technicality or maybe cut it a little high, whatever the case may be. So maybe they're being a little cautious. there going into the third deadlift, knowing the tendencies of like, you miss a third squat, you very high probability. You're going to miss a third deadlift as well. So maybe they played it a little bit safe on that, but you're right. I mean, if he had hit that world record, squat 336 he would have been right there um i mean he would have probably surpassed kaiko and would have been knocking right on the door there with jesus's total as well that's right um, and for winning this whole thing jonathan came out like his deadlifts were moving relatively slow so i was pretty like interested to see but he's known he's known for being able to finish relatively well um so that third it moved and i think everybody was like on their feet shouting for him because that was a great third attempt. Um, so just to to be able to see powerlifting America up there with Jesus, Jonathan, and Gavin, it was yeah. really cool to see. It's just yeah. again, kind of broadcasting what you're about to get like in Malta. Oh, like, 100%. Take a good look at that podium because it's about to look <laughs> about to look like a lot of Americans on all the podiums at yeah. Worlds. Um, but I mean, not even just the top three, the top five. Um, yeah. all Americans and then Mikey coming in in seventh. So damn near a clean sweep. If it wasn't for Emil Norling, you know, just being a, uh, an absolute beast and like someone who always seems to pull off clutch deadlifts when it matters the most. Day. What's that? He had an awful day. Like yeah. I was surprised. And, but I, okay. Awful in terms of, um, you know, what His he standards. Was. Yes. But his total is still amazing. Yeah. Like it's still great. So as far as like, um, how many attempts he had, probably not his best day, but just looking total wise, still very, very strong and something a lot of people still can't do. <laughs> so. Yeah. And I think I remember, uh, I had the scouting report from the strength guys, um, for his weight class, uh, and IPF worlds in South Africa. And I think I remember it said like, he always makes his third deadlift. Um, and in this case he didn't, but he didn't have to, um, but they were I mean, wondering about a weight cut. Cause he weighed in right at one of five on the so dot. Maybe this is harder weight cut this time. Um, kind of maybe took a little bit out of him. Of course, we we don't know the ins and outs of that leading up to it. Um, so it's, you know, it's all speculation at this point. But um, yeah, Emil is, he performs well. So I wouldn't base this competition off of what he is going to produce in South, or whoa, whoa South Africa, rewind, um, what he's going to do in Malta, because I know come Malta time, it's going to be a new Emil. And maybe yeah. his nerves got into it. Mm -hmm. you know this was a this was a big competition um you know I do I do feel uh Delaney Wallace um I think there should have been like kind of like a fourth podium there because when he hit the gritty live, oh yeah that deserved a placement in itself he <laughs> 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 just could have just scooched over a little bit because Delaney just he got that award in my book <laughs> yeah um so yeah, let's talk about, let's, let's go through each of the men here for power to power in America and talk about, it because I mean, we had some amazing performances here. We talked about Kaiko and Gavin and Jesus, but Delaney also put up a big, big total. He put up a 835, which is a massive PR for him. I think that's like a 12 kilo PR or something like that for him. It's he pulled to break the world record on his third deadlift and wasn't quite there. Again, you know, like this is a, a unique kind of competition with a lot of hype and everything. People run out of gas a little bit. If you look at the results, the pretty much only three men made their final deadlift, you know, and the whole entire competition. Oh, what's that? I thought he was going to get that third deadlift. I, I thought so too. It, it came off the floor and I was like, he's going to do this. And, and I mean, and, and he was so close. So I think he, he, that is definitely on the table for him at Worlds. Again, at Worlds, it's a different animal. You have to win. The gold medal and so you sometimes like if you look at someone like taylor or jesus or even bonica you know athletes like this like they're not going to be pushed to to that point and also like he ended up winning at ipf worlds in south africa by a pretty considerable amount after Ina missed his third deadlift i think he ended up winning by you know a good comfortable amount so 
he might not have to go 835 and beyond at Worlds. So we might not see that again until the next Sheffield or the next meet like this, maybe U.S. Nationals next year when he can really go all out, something like that. But man, a signature performance and someone who, you know, I think there was a lot of people kind of chirping about his totals and about his performances in the past and things like this. And so far, all he's done is win nationals, win worlds, and then put up one of the best performances at Sheffield on the biggest stage ever, you know, a huge 835 total. And I'm just looking real quick, again, if we kind of look at some other metrics, because obviously that total is put up by one of the greatest athletes the sport has ever seen in Russ. So it's a big total to be competing with and playing with, right? But if yeah. we look at dots, Delaney finished in second on the men's side behind only Jesus with the 564 dots uh, behind Jesus at 592 and a half. So Delaney's performance was massive. And right behind him with a 563 dots would have been Jonathan Keiko. And then right behind that would have been Taylor Atwood with a 563 as well. And then Gavin Aiden with a 560. So they're all like, you know, neck and neck right there, depending on what kind of coefficient you want to look at or whatever the case may be. Yeah. Um, Delaney's just, he's a showman on stage. Oh God. Yeah. And he's a performer and he does it well, you know, it's, he's very personable. It's hard not to like Delaney. Oh, yeah. Um, and you know, his, his squats, especially his second and his third, it's like, Oh, what does he have left? Cause he also took a, a bigger jump going from first uh, attempt to second attempt. And then um, the commentators were a little bit hesitant about how this third was going to go, but it moved the same way. Um, and some people, that's just how they lift, right? So you kind of have to know the lifter on that base. Um, you know, it's him, again, hitting the gritty or hitting whatever little Latin dance move he was making before. Salsa. He was, yeah, he was saucy. Like, that's what we want to see. He's having fun. He's yeah. having fun. The crowd's having fun watching him. Like, we love it. That's his signature thing. Yeah. Like, um, I want to see more salsa dancing and hello. I don't know if you guys knew this, but he also sings. Oh, I know. He's a, like a quintuple. I made player. him send me an audio thing of it. Cause I uh -huh. just couldn't believe it. And oh, so can... like, I made the whole gym listen to it. Cause if I had to, you know, like this is what we're working out to today. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> the ball trades. He's, he's, he's the complete package. Honestly. I mean, if you're, if you're, I mean, he can sing, he can dance, he's an accountant. He's, you know, obviously a world champion power lifter. I mean, he, he's got it all. Well, if I win worlds this year, um, I'm going to request that Delaney Wallace sing the national anthem. Oh, nice. <laughs> Would they, do they do that at worlds? Who, how do they No, They just play the little, just give him the mic. Yeah. Just they play the little rinky dink tape version yeah, like, no yeah. i want the voice of delaney wallace singing the national anthem i'm gonna go ahead and tell him that to you i'm not I, you know what i'm gonna message gaston yeah like, yeah so when, you have to do this <laughs> and and talking of just about you know his actual like lifting performance as well he was mm -hmm. eight for eight going in that last deadlift and he loaded up two break russ's yeah. all-time best total um right. which you know, that's something that meant more to him than maybe just putting, he, he went up seven and a half. Maybe if he had only put up five, he could have done that and jumped a spot onto the podium. I'm not sure exactly what that would have totaled for him or whatever, but I think he needed the 337 and a half to, to get above a hundred percent on the world. No, cause he was at 99.28. Yeah. So five more kilos, he might've been, been up into over a hundred percent, broke the world record total. So but we'll probably see that in Malta. Yeah. Very a close. As long as he stays healthy, which I'm sure he will and keeps doing the right things. I think we're again, going to see a strong performance from him in Malta. Um, and you know, that longstanding Russell or he world record could be taken down, which is iconic. You know, Russ mm -hmm. is very, very strong, you know, and it's, it's one of those things like world records are hard to break. That's why they stand so long. <laughs> um, so, you know, I think it did mean a lot for Delaney's to go after that third attempt to potentially like, why not? You're there. Why yeah. not go after the world record total? Like you can get a check, you can have that, you know, title to your name. So I do think he should have went for it. Um, and I'm glad that he did because 
I mean, now we can see how close he is to getting it. He he's to his knees at getting it. <laughs> so yeah. 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 841 is the world record total. And the number that he put up 835. So yeah, he was pulling to break that world record total without trying to pull a deadlift world record, which is, you know, that's why he had to go above and beyond the world record. Um, Julia, is there anything that you want to add in on Delaney's performance? I know you've like crunched the numbers and everything, and you, you were the one who like wrote out all the, the final results. Was there anything I was saying that was incorrect? No, 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 you were correct. I would (laughs) say, um, you know, obviously Gavin was very impressive. Um, Keiko was very impressive and, and Jesus was very impressive, but I think, you know, my second, my second choice for um, who I was most impressed by um, of the men, um, besides Jesus, obviously, um, it's Delaney, because a lot of people really wrote him off. And there were a lot of people saying, you know, you know, questioning whether he deserved to be there, saying they could beat him, all kinds of things like that. And he really, really showed what he was capable of on the biggest stage where it really counts. So um, I was very, very happy to see that. Well, I'm glad Delaney showed that he deserved to be there. Oh, yeah. I and mean, all those people chirping. That's all people do anyways. Like, you know what? If you were good enough, you would have been there. And I mean, talk, <laughs> talk about, de- talk about deserve to be there. He yeah. auto qualified from worlds. He wasn't right. even like a wild card or anything. I mean, that's why it's so strange. People, you know, talk about Delaney. Um, but again, like we talking on dots, he mm-hmm. finished in second place. Um, if we're talking on, I just sorted it here by IPF Goodlift points. He finished in second place behind Keiko. If we were using Goodlift points, so Goodlift points, pretty weird because it changes all of this. I, I think it definitely doesn't favor super heavies at yeah. all because it would have been Keiko, Delaney, Gavin, and then Jesus. Right. You know, and so which so you know take these coefficients for what they are, but it's just another metric to show that. Delaney Wallace had one of the best performances of anyone. Everyone's going to be living in the shadow of Jesus Olivares from now on to quote um, Julia Williams, beautiful caption that she wrote about uh, living in the shadow of Ray Williams up until now. Um, But Delaney Wallace put, should put everyone on notice. Like that was arguably the second best performance at, at Sheffield. And I mean, right there with Keiko and Gavin as well. So, I mean, it was a very tight finish for, for the three of them. He also secured his spot on the national team again. So yep. um, that performance alone sealed him the deal for that. Um, so it's kind of like talk all you want, but Delaney is showing up and, you know, he's doing what he needs to make sure that he's staying in top in the 83s. I think he's doing well. Um, you know, Gavin, Keiko doing well in the 93s. I mean, mm-hmm. they're disputed right now. Um, I know Gavin's also coached by Kedrick, so his nutrition was right where it needed to be. Mm-hmm. Um, and Taylor Atwood also coached by Kedrick and nutrition. Shout out Kedrick. God, yeah. he was, Kedrick. he was cooking up something, will he? <laughs> he sure all over right there. Right. <laughs> but yeah. I mean, that, that is one thing I did ask Kedrick. Um, I was like, is everybody good on weight where they need to be? Um, he was like, yeah, like everything's going fine. So there was no like harsh weight cuts or anything like that. And, you know, that's also something to factor in when you are performing, like, are you cutting too much weight? Are you going to lose strength? Um, you know, Taylor made weight easily. Um, obviously he didn't have the performance that he wanted. He didn't get his third attempt squat, um, which, you know, that's unusual for us to see for Taylor. I mean, we usually see these phenomenal performances, from Taylor, but this also allows us to know that Taylor is also human. And sometimes like we just don't have our best meat. So, um, you know, I still think that he performed well, all things considering, I mean, again, he was very, very close. He was at one point, like 99.9% at the, uh, world record total on his third, he did miss it. Um, so that kind of, back a little bit because you know obviously the people were like well if he's at 99.9 why didn't he just go over that 100 mark so he could get that check but um there was a reason behind that like taylor probably knew like i want to go for this but this is maybe i don't even have this Mm -hmm. Um, but you you just put it all out there and taylor did what he could day of and still a phenomenal performance again like 
very, very close to the world record total. Um, I, it's not a secret that he's been battling through like a little injury. So to still show up and do that is amazing. And, and I heard some food poisoning, um, injuries, you know, a lot of things plaguing Taylor for this, but you mentioned something there, which is that he misses third squat, which we don't ever see. And I just pulled it up. He has not missed a single squat. Um, you have to go back to 2014. And Taylor competes, you know, at least a couple times every single year. So he has not missed a single squat since 2014. So when we saw that third squat miss, you know, which it's very rare, like it, like him and his his team, they make their right attempt selection. They, as you can see, they don't miss hardly ever, um, especially they've n- almost never missed on squat. So when we saw that third squat miss, we knew something was up with Taylor, like that Taylor wasn't hundred percent, that this was a, a different Taylor Atwood, the human version of Taylor Atwood, um, as opposed to the machine that we're accustomed to seeing. So, but you know, the man is, uh, you know, again, we're talking, you know, we don't want to use the word goat too, too lightly. He's definitely in the goat category. Um, and he's still got a lot of room. He's still super strong. This is Taylor on a very bad, like one of his worst performances. And he's still right there with the world record total, obviously way less than what we've seen him do in the past, but we know he'll be back as soon as he gets these injuries rehabbed and he'll be ready to go and get that gold medal for team USA at worlds and Malta for sure. Oh yeah. Like still in the 74 kilo class, like very undisputed, Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's hard to beat Taylor Atwood. It, and obviously it's hard to beat Taylor Atwood when he's having a bad day. I mean, yeah. who else can say that? Yeah, <laughs> um, a lot of you bad day, you're second or third. Um, but Taylor Atwood on a bad day is still number one undisputed in this weight class. Mm. Uh, so I know that his, I mean, you said it before we started, Jason's very smart. He's an intelligent man. Mm. And I know he's going to have Taylor right when Malta comes around. So you know, we might see another form of him. We might see the Taylor that we're typically used to seeing instead of the human form of Taylor that we saw yesterday. But again, like this is a reminder that, you know, all lifters do have their downfalls and, you know, we are all human. So it's, you know, it's okay. It's okay to mess up. It's okay to have those bad days. But I do think, you know, these fires being lit, I don't think, ta- I mean, the same with Amanda not getting that best overall female lifter last year. I don't think Taylor liked the outcome of it, all this. And no. I think that, you know, of course, like people are going to talk, they're going to do this, they're going to do that. They're going to try to get under him. But I think you got to be careful on the the skins you think you're crawling under because all you're doing is just igniting something within them that's going to showcase something greater than I think we've ever seen. And I think yeah. this is what Taylor needed. I think Mm -hmm. the little shove off that he needed to be able to say, you know what? I don't like how this feels. I don't like not being myself. Not saying that you're handbagged in training, but also while you're injured, you can only do so much. Yeah. So you're not going to, you know, re-hurt yourself or make that injury worse. So to show up, perform still very well, I think you know, you can't be too mad about it. No, absolutely. And he, we saw his post today, um, on Instagram, he's already, he's already made his post and everything. And so he's in good spirits and, you know, he, he's, he knows who he is. He's, he's not out here. You know, he has nothing to prove. It wasn't a situation like Delaney where he probably felt like he really had something to prove or Jesus too, you know, where he really had something to prove at this meet you know, Taylor's already done that. So, um, he's already, if he, if he was retired now, his legacy would last forever. So he's fine. He'll come back. But I hope, like you said, these adversity that people face, it hopefully will fire them up and, um, you know, push for, to, so we can see a new Taylor out without do something that we can never even thought was possible after this. Um, Julia, did you have anything that you want to add on any of these men? Um, yeah, just, uh, real quick about Taylor. Um, I did notice his, um, after his third squat, when they took the bar, he kind of looked like he was in pain and he came out with a knee sleeve on one of his legs for bench, not even, you know, for deadlift. Um, so, you know, clearly, um, something was bothering him. And I think, you know, in that situation, I've competed injured before. It takes a lot to, especially in a stage like that, to come out and still really try to hit your best lifts like that that's courageous of him and I think that 
you know, he does like to talk, other people like to talk. And so maybe it kind of gets lost, um, you know, what he had to do at that point. Um, but it's still worth mentioning that that's what he did was a very hard thing to do. And under the circumstances, he did, he did really well. Yeah. I mean, his favorite, his favorite athlete is Allen Iverson and Allen Iverson, a famous is famous for playing injured and showing up. And, he, and also Iverson would always wear like a elbow sleeve on one side. So maybe the knee sleeve on one side too, was just fitting, you know, um, for, for what's well, that? I bet you, you're going to see some guys in the gym now wearing one knee sleeve on their knee because Taylor Atwood wore one knee sleeve on his knee. Oh, this is going to fix my problems. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and I, I think he had a post leading into this too, where he, he was showing his Iverson shoes that he, you know, and I think he had like one elbow sleeve on or one knee sleeve on for that as well. Um, maybe it's related to injury. Maybe it's a fashion statement, um, kind of indicating like, I'm like Iverson, I, I play injured and I'm still gonna, you know, be one of the best in the world, even injured. And, and I'm still going to go out on my shield. So that was really cool to, I mean, I think you, you had a really good point there, Julia, with that, um, so very cool to see, like, you know, even injured, he's going to put up huge numbers. So, but he has a great team. We know he's going to be back. But um, another person I want to talk about was Michael Davis. So Michael ended up finishing seventh, um, had a big performance, didn't have the day that he wanted, but he looked strong. And I mean, he was pushing for everything. He missed two attempts only and still had a really good day. Um, and he was at 97% of the world record. We knew going into this, that Anatoly and the 105s has put up a world record total that is so high that it was going to be extremely difficult for Mikey to be able to break that world record. But um, he still had a great performance, still, you know, only missed those two lifts, missed his third bench and um, missed his third deadlift as well. So do you guys have anything to say about Michael? Uh, Mikey was also a wild card along with Keiko. Yeah. And um, so again, to like come out as a wild card, and not even like, like he came out and said, you know what? I'm going to challenge this world record. Right. And, and ended up like 97%, you said. Yeah. 97.3, which is, that's a big world record too. We already knew that this class was stacked as well as like the 93s and the 83s, but you know, that Mikey had an amazing performance. Um, so again, it's, it might have not been exactly the one that he wanted, but again, you go seven for nine and still in the 97 percentile, like. Yeah. And I mean, he, he went head to head, like the battle with him and Emil, mm -hmm. you know, this is going to be ran back again for a third time at worlds in Malta. So it'll be a lot of hype and a lot of excitement to see if Mikey can finally beat Emil Norling. Um, but you know, Emil only won by two and a half kilos, barely beat him, just edged him out. It's not an if it's when it's a win That's exactly you know okay. um i always like to really check my verbiage on things and to put it in a more positive note because like with mikey it's not about if mikey wins i always say when mikey wins because he has set himself up to do just that mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right and, and, and if i you... don't guess when you take this world record bench like there's no like, oh, maybe uh, 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 let's go ahead and start manifesting that now, because when Mikey does out total him at Worlds, I'm going to be like, run this clip back real quick. <laughs> yes. 233.5 um, is the world record on bench. And so, I mean, he's he's definitely within striking distance of that. Um, he didn't put it in, you know, he missed 225, but I know that he's within striking distance and that that is something that he can possibly get. And if you look at Mikey's trend, he did a 915 at Warcat back in 2021. We talked about this on his check-in coming into this meet. He did a 915 in the past, but he injured himself badly while doing that 915. And it's been a slow comeback since then um, where he did like an 892, a 910, a 9, and then now a 912 and a half. So he's trending in the right direction. Like you said, missing two lifts, still trending up. You know, he's probably good for like 920 if he can hit all of his lifts right now, um, which would be to mill. And then he's getting stronger. I mean, he's a smart, he, he trains hard. He's in there with Jesus. Um, I think he told us on the, on the um, check-in podcast that he was doing like, he does a six day split. I mean, he's a hardworking man. He's a smart coach. Um, so there's no question that Michael Davis, we haven't seen the last of him and he's going to be a threat 
at Worlds, no question about it. And we'll just see if Anatoly's back or not. I'm sorry? We'll just see if Anatoly's back or not, you know, in the 105s. That 105 class is going to be stacked if Anatoly comes back. Michael, Emil, that's a three-way battle right there. It is. And, um, you know, feeding off of like, you know, Mikey doing the six-day train split. Like, he's also a family man. He just bought a house. You know, he's been very like focused on his personal life as well and making sure that that's also being very successful, not just in lifting. Uh, So to to be able to still get that training time in, well, I mean, because buying a house, it ain't, you know, it's not a snap of the fingers, you know, Um, he's a full time powerlifting coach. (laughs) I mean, he's out here living the dream, making a living off the sport that he loves and has dedicated his life to. There's no there's no question. Michael Davis is got more in the tank and he's back and he's still oh, yeah. a young man at 27 years old, you know, so a lot of room in the, left in the tank for him. I think at worlds to the attempt selection, the calls will be a lot different to yeah. where they will be set up to where he can um, not only take the gold for team USA and for himself, but um, you know, to secure that world record total as well, because he is that close. Yeah, for sure. That's why I always make that when he does take it, because I feel deep in my soul he is going to take it at worlds yeah yeah for sure i would say that and um that and amanda deadlifting 600 are um a when you know that's a those are when statements not if statements um i also wanted to add real quick um we've been talking about the you know mikey's an alternate um all three of the uh, Powerless for America athletes who were on the podium for the men were alternates. Um, and wow. so I think that that, you know, and of course Evie was an alternate too. Um, I think that that just really shows that um, having those alternates that, that we can pick from, having that pool that we can pick from is important. And I think it also encourages people who might not win their weight class for whatever reason to keep pushing themselves extremely hard because you never know if that spot's going to come your way and you know Mikey took advantage of it he he took advantage of it and he did really well um as all of the power of America alternates did so yeah really, really really good point there I mean like hats off SBD like uh you know Pete and everyone over there who were in this this selection process, they give themselves this wiggle room with these wildcard spots to make sure that the best athletes in the world were going to be represented here. And they picked the right ones. Cause like you said, I mean, the, the first place finisher on both sides didn't make it through the first selection process at, by winning their weight class at worlds and getting within 95% of the world record total. And so whichever, however, which way, whether they came in through the secondary or the third, uh, wildcard spots or whatever, I mean, the hats off to SBD, they picked the right people and they put on a huge show and with their performances. Um, before we haven't really talked too much about Jonathan Kaiko in detail. And I think, you know, this is another like a story like with Delaney. He's one of these guys that everyone loves. He's one of the nicest people in the sport. And you, you know, we saw him lose his throne at IPF Worlds in South Africa. And then now he has reclaimed it. You know, the, the world is back in order again with Kaiko standing on top. He's got put up an 884 kilo total, which is a huge total at 93 kilos. Um, and, you know, he finished in second place, walking away with 17,000 pounds. What does that come out to in dollars, Julia? Do you have that off the top of your head? I do not, but I have it in the recaps. Yeah, seventeen thousand pounds. It's a it's a good amount of money. Twenty one three ninety seven. So two thousand like twenty one four hundred basically. So he lost his world championship status um, in South Africa, but then on the biggest stage in the world uh, at Sheffield, he puts up a world record total, walks away with over twenty grand. Um, amazing performance once again. I mean, he he misses third squat, which is. Uh, strange because as we know, he rarely misses any lifts. Um, and he almost never misses squats. And so that was a little bit strange. We were a little bit nervous. Um, he told, he put in a 300 kilo squat for his second and it looked pretty tough. And we we're kind of like thinking what the hell is going on here? And then he goes 302.5 and 
came out and fought for it and everything, but missed it. And I, I thought at that point I was nervous for him. You know, I was like, this, this could be another situation. Like we saw at worlds where it's like the wheels are going to fall off. And, and like, you know, we know the statistics, you miss your third squat, high probability. You're going to miss your third deadlift. You're going to make miss more attempts going along the way. Um, but he had a real different kind of vibe. Uh, if you saw him uh, throughout the entire meet, like when they would show him in the warm up room or, or they show him in like the side stage area. And then when he was com- finishing a lift, he just seemed very chilled out. Like he seemed like a different Jonathan Keiko than we've ever seen before. He was playing to the crowd. He was dancing. I think at one point he was walking off and then he walked back you know, over towards the stage and was like celebrating. And like, that's just not what you normally see from Jonathan Keiko. He's normally very reserved and a very quiet person. But um, despite missing that third squad, it looked like he was having fun out there. Like really like on the biggest stage, you, you could have easily clammed up and been more nervous. If you're already like a more of an introvert kind of person, which I think he is, then, you know, you could have really you know, clammed up on that huge stage with the, in front of that crowd and knowing that there's over a hundred thousand people watching on the live stream, you know, things like this. Um, but he didn't, he rose to the occasion. He came back, shook off that squat, was in high spirits, finished the day six for six and took home the dub. I mean, and came out, had to pull his last deadlift, had to hit that 342.5 final pull to win over Gavin and, you know, barely, you know, sneak by Gavin on the podium and he did it, man. And so I was hats off to him. It was a great, great performance. And it just looked like he was having fun out there. Yeah, it really did. It, it did look like he was having fun. Um, you know, there, there is that one clip of, it might've been, um, him going out for his final deadlift, but he was a little bit behind the curtain and you, the camera followed Gavin, um, backstage. And then all you yeah. see is just Jonathan so focused and it's, it's like, oh man, like this is the shot right here. This yes. is like out of a movie. <laughs> hey, we have to shout out Zaki Faruqi, who who was it yes. does the roaming camera for us at our nationals, and he was doing the roaming camera um, for the live stream at SBD. Amazing, you know. Ryan mentioned it on the on the live stream and everything. I mean, it was it looked like a shot right out of a movie, and Kaiko's just like looking like so determined, waiting in the wings, and Gavin celebrating. It yeah, was amazing. I mean, Jonathan knew like he needed this, mm-hmm. you know, like, yeah, Gavin could be his friend. They could be buds. Cool. Whatever. But mm-hmm. at this point, he's like, nah, Gavin, get out of my way, you know, celebrate over there because I got something to do in a second. Yep. And, you know, there, there was no losing focus. You know, Jonathan is very, you know, common collective guy. And I think that's where it kind of separates. Like he can have fun, but he also knows how to flip that switch and say, you know what? I got, I got to stay focused for this lift or I can potentially miss it because we saw how a second moved. So Mm -hmm. he came out for that third, like it was a grinder trying to get that lift up and it was beautiful. Like he, he definitely played that very well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And 342.5 is, 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 you know, just five kilos below his best ever deadlift. So to put that up in on the stage and under the circumstances and, Maybe he could have grinded out a little bit more um, if he had to, but he put the number on the bar the exactly the right amount that he needed to chip Gavin and take over that second spot on the podium. Julia, you were going to say something before. What? Yeah. Go ahead. Um, so I think you know he did miss his third deadlift, but he mi- or his third squat, but he missed it on a call, um, and he stood it up. And I think mm-hmm. that is important because even though the the judges turned down his um third squat he still got it he still grinded through it and he still stood up with it and that is even though it probably fatigued him quite a bit it's confidence boosting um and I think you know being able to struggle through that squat really probably gave him the confidence to know that he could grind through his third deadlift you know whatever the whatever the judges are going to call they're going to call but at the end of the day if you can lift it um i think that that is a big big uh positive so it's a big win so yeah it's a big win it's just the only thing with it was just like you know anytime you see like a 93 kilo or like one of the heavier you know middle to upper weight weight classes only going up two and a half kilos on a squat like you know their second was work you know like you know they kind of might have messed up on on that second attempt selection 
or it could have been a misgroove or it could have been a lot of different things. They weren't hyped up enough. They get more hyped up for the final, but going up only two and a half, usually it's kind of a bad sign on squat for, especially in the male weight classes that are up there, like 93s and up. Um, but Gavin or uh, Jonathan, he's so on the men's side, there were only five world records broken. And and Jonathan broke two of them, two of those five you know, with the bench press, 241.5, massive bencher. He's Mr. Bench. Um, I think Julia called him Bench Hashira, which I don't watch anime, so I don't know what that means. But basically, he's the king of benches, uh, 241.5. And then also he broke the world record total after Gavin. So the world records that were broken was Gavin broke the world record total first, and then Kaiko broke it. And then also Jesus broke the deadlift world record with a ridiculous 410 deadlift. Um, and then also Jesus broke the world record total as well. So those were the only world records that we had on the men's side. Um, you know, if, if there's one thing that we could say, it would be like the men need to step up to the level of the ladies, you know, um, the women broke a ton more world records than the men. So, um, we'll just put that out there as a challenge for the men to come to Sheffield next time, ready to uh, do better <laughs> and compete with the women who broke so many more world records. Women are fierce, man. Yeah. Like, I don't know. I always say like, obviously like I'm a woman, like, but I mean, just build different. <laughs> yeah. Like, it's just like, we could be going through so much pain. You're not gonna know about it. Or we, you know, like it's yeah. women are just, they're crazy. The, well, they're making this sport just so amazing. Obviously, the men are doing a great job too, but you see a lot more women coming into the sport now because, like, they've been surrounded by such positive, strong women. That's all you see on social media now. It's just, yep. And it's because of role models like yourself, Amanda, Bonica, you know, these, uh, Leah, we're, I mean, everyone on this list, Eva, Evie, for instance, I, one thing I want to mention about Evie. Now, a lot of people might not know, she was just elected the president of the New Zealand Powerlifting Federation. Um, so, I mean, she is actually like not, and, and, and if you listen to, if you go back and listen to the King of the List podcast, when they covered the Commonwealth recap, I think they had Eric Helms on there, Dr. Eric Helms. Um, and you listen to him talking about Evie, she ran that meet. I mean, she worked her ass off for that meet. I mean, and you could just imagine, you know how hard it is to pull off these powerlifting meets. That Commonwealth Games, I think they they had like a crazy number of countries involved. They had hundreds of lifters on the powerlifting part of it. And it, it would have been, it was a ton of work from what uh, Eric was saying on that podcast. It sounded like it was a really hard, um, a ton of work for them to host that meet. And Evie did, Evie did a ton of that work behind the scenes. And he, I think he might've even said something like, to the detriment of her own performance, at that meet, she was running that meet while competing in that meet. And then, you know, this is the kind of people that we need in the sport, people that are, you know, put the sport above themselves. And it's, um, so that's one of the reasons why I was really happy. You know, obviously we want the Americans to win, but if you could pick anyone out of this lineup that you would, you know, be happy with winning it, Evie is just that kind of person to, to be so young and be the president of, of a major powerlifting federation and stuff like that. I mean, it's just, she's a role model. And like, it gets to the point that you're saying, I think I just counted up the women, I think broke like 18 world records. Yes. Did I count? I'm not sure if I counted this wrong, but that's a ton. Like I said, the men broke five. So the men out there, they're going to have to step it up. The women have raised the bar. They've set the standard and uh, we'll have to see if the men can, you know, rise to the challenge for the next one. Yeah. Stop arguing on social media. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's what it is. Men are, are spending too much time on social media. I know that is something actually, um, I, I mentioned it to Julia yesterday when we were talking about uh, posting, reposting and stuff. I like, I want to, I try to go out of my way to repost women uh, more often, you know, because I really want to create a spotlight on these amazing role models that we're talking about. And it's difficult sometimes because women don't post as much and the men will post every little thing you know, every little, you know, uh, and, and so for the women out there, man, just, just post, post all your stuff more. I mean, I guess maybe you're saying that's why they, they broke 18 world records. Cause they were busy training and not talking and chirping on social media. Yeah. I mean, so. girls, we just do it, you know, behind everybody's backs. 
you know, we can do it to our friends. We don't go on social media because then like you're going to get called out and then you're going to cry. You know, so you just keep it off of social media, right? Uh, but I mean, kudos to the women setting a standard. Yeah. All right. So real quick, we'll wrap this up here in a minute, but um, just looking ahead now, <clears throat> we saw some performances yesterday. Um, let's talk again about on the women's side and looking ahead to the U S national team, which we went over at the beginning and we talked about, so some of these performances that are going to be relevant to the U S national team, especially Jod in the 57s put up a 503. We know Natalie Richards put up a 501. Um, so that's going to be a heated battle. Um, it looked like Natalie Richards at, at PA Nats had more in the tank and talking with her and her coach, Steve Denovi right afterwards, they're good for a lot more than 500. I mean, we're talking, they're going into 510, 520 range, possibly at Worlds. I mean, especially with their training. Go ahead, Heather. <laughs> Let me just say, now Natalie probably thinks I just dog on her a lot. Now I like Natalie. Natalie's strong. But what upset me the most about Natalie in the past is she was with a coach that just held her back. Right. So I always said, the, and I would say this to people all the time, the best thing Natalie can do is get with a different coach. Mm -hmm. Right. And sure enough, she did. And she has put herself in a position to where I'm telling you right now, she's going to win the 57 kilo world champion. Unless something drastic happens, she is going to win. Right. Like I'm a realist when it comes to the sport. Mm -hmm. I never hated Natalie. I just knew her potential was being held back. Yeah. So now that she's in this position, I know Steve is going to get her to this world championship and she's going to win it. That's not saying anything about all these other girls are weaker. No, she is just freakishly strong. Yeah. And there were, I mean, she, she did, she, she did hit that 500 kilo total. The first one, I believe, yes. to ever do it, 501.5. Yes. And that was that, you know, I know we were putting a lot of attention on the people that were competing yesterday. Yeah. But I wanted that. I said it when Ryan said, it. I'm like, nah, 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 nah. Natalie Richards was the first 57 kilo woman to hit 500 kilos. It might have not been on an international stage, but mm. she was the first to do it. And I give credit where it's due. Now, kudos to Joy. And then for, for just putting on amazing performances, but yeah. I know it's going to be a three-way battle come worlds. And I know Natalie's about to come out on top unless joy just pulls something out for her final deadlift. Yeah. Which I mean, not heard of either. <laughs> I mean, they both joy, joy and Jod both did really well. I mean, they both were, broke 500 kilos for the first time, you know, 500.5 for joy and 503.5 for Jod. And I mean, they both pulled huge deadlifts. Um, so I think I mean, Jod was even shocked on her third deadlift. Yeah, I mean, two, patience on her unreal Two two 230.5 for, for joy. And then 231 to break the world record for Jad, amazing, uh, amazing performances by both of those ladies. And, and, but as we said, I mean, that this is going to be an amazing three-way battle. I mean, and because those, those two, even though we saw Natalie, I saw it with my own eyes, like she has more in the tank and I heard her talking with her coach afterwards and I know they have big plans and I know she's training hard. Like she lives in the gym. Um, it, it powerlifting is everything for her. So like you said, Team USA is going to get that gold medal, but it's going to be a fun one to watch for sure. Yeah. Thank goodness I'm staying this whole time at Worlds because I'm not missing these opportunities. No, oh, I'm no. going to watch that. And nobody better bother me while I'm watching it either. Nobody. Yes. <laughs> and so, and then the other, you know, looking looking around like uh, uh, all the other performances here, you know, one of the big ones that's a preview for Worlds is the 76s. Um, and so, you know, we've got Dana McNeil in that weight class. And so Dana is going to be competing with these girls here, man, they, they're putting up huge numbers, but that will be an exciting one to watch. Um, also we're looking at what Leah might do 63 or 69. Um, she at this weight class 63, just did a 548. That's a huge total. We know that if she comes down to fit to 63, she's going to have to deal with Meg Scanlon, who has done a 537 and a half. 
She just did a 510 yesterday. I think it was like a 510 at uh, at a, a meet in Australia with her coach, you know, which is we're just a month out from her doing 520 at PA Nats. And so Meg is really on one. Her training's on point. She's looking really good. Um, it looks like it will only be Leah that can maybe come down if she wants to come back down to 63 and try and challenge. Otherwise, Meg, um, if she can, imp- and also I think yesterday she was talking, I, I didn't get to see the numbers very close, but that her bench is going to be back to where it was before the new bench rules. And so she'll be coming for a world record bench. And she'll also be, you know, adding on kilos onto that big total that she already put up 537 and a half. So she's right there. Leah 548 yesterday. Leah's injured or or is working through injuries. You know, she's got something going on. We're not exactly sure what, what it is, but one way or another, she'll either have to go against Meg Scanlon in the 63s, or she'll have to go against Chelsea Savitt in the 69s. And Chelsea has also been like on a massive tear, like PRs on everything, putting up, looking like the, she's in the prime of her life as far as powerlifting is concerned. And you know what? The good thing about Chelsea Savitt is she also did bench nationals. So while she was in the same boat as, Megan Scanlon with, you know, the, the new bench rules kind of playing a hard effect on them. Um, they both seem to adapt it pretty well. Obviously there's needs to be some technical changes a little bit just to make sure that nothing can be called. Um, but I do know that they're on the right path to making sure that they're right where they need to be, um, which I brought up bench nationals because I think that was only going to help Chelsea a little bit to make sure that her bench is where it needs to be come worlds. Um, because she knows that she also needs to hit that standard at bench nationals or bench worlds um, to be able to get that world record bench, which she can. Uh, So it's, I think that was very smart on her. I don't think that's why she did bench nationals, but um, it definitely helped because I mean, not like powerlifting America bench nationals, like she did get warned on her depth. So coming into uh, open nationals, like she did just fine. Um, you know, we, we've seen higher from her, but, um, I think she's adapting well, the same way with Meg, I think she's adapting as well. Um, so I think by the time worlds comes around, that's going to be something that adds a bit more kilos to their total to where they can be pushing some people pretty good. And I mean, also we can mention Chandler Babs in that weight class as well in the 69s. Um, so, you know, shout out to her. An American lifter lifting with USVI. Um, we're we're still proud of her. And um, but okay, so, so final on the women's side, the last weight class that we want to talk about. We've got one of them here, the 47s. <laughs> Tiff put up a big number, 428.5. She chipped her world record. So what's your preview then, Heather, for Team USA's chances of going against and dethroning Tiff? Oh, what's happening? Okay. <laughs> You you bring this out. Uh, it's it's Tiff is a very she's a strong competitor. I'll give her that. But um, you know, listen, I I've been there. I've been at the top, I've been there multiple times, and it's hard when you're there. And I know if Tiff has the right attempts made, you know, it's She's going to have a fantastic day, Mm -hmm. but you can't just, you know, push me and Jess to the side because you got two hitters coming and, you know, obviously I've had my health issues, but they're on the, they're on the rise now. Like that's getting under control. Um, I'm doing what I need to do to make sure I'm at my healthiest and that my flights get there. Yeah. (laughs) We ain't going to show up like the day before anymore, because um, I'm going to, I'm telling you, I've already, I already have it all planned out. I'm getting there six days early and right. that's it. Like, um, so I, I was speaking to Jess yesterday. I told her when you take that world record bench, you know, and her bench step, she's fine. Yep. Talk about that too. She, she sent me an updated picture. Like that should probably worry some people. Because now she doesn't have to worry about that. She just needs to worry about adding to it. Mm -hmm. Um, And she is a very good bencher, but she's also a very good squatter and very good deadlifter. Yeah, she's well-rounded. She's going to be hard to beat. So it's what I tell people is it makes it hard because when, you know, we are both on our A game, we're going to both be very hard to beat. And where it comes into me, I have 
significantly the highest deadlift um, of all 47s. So it's it will come down again, once again, to what is Heather Goner going to put in for her third attempt? Because mm -hmm. I'm going to go for the win. I didn't, I didn't get to have these chances, and I've, I've, you know, been put in positions that no one really wants to be put in. But I'm still here. I'm not knocked down yet. And you know, I don't want to just speak on um, me and Jess because I know Australia has somebody. Canada has somebody. So it ain't just me and Jess coming after her. It's a whole slew of 103 pound females, mm -hmm. you know, and I just sit back and I laugh. I'm like, dang, you got one from this angle and this angle from above from below. Like, it's crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. The amount. And I said it in 2019, when we had first got invited to Sheffield for 2020, the yeah. one question that they asked me was, Heather, what do you think Sheffield is going to do? What do you think Sheffield is going to do for lifters? I said, um, it's going to bring out the people that have never heard of this, this sport before. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And look where we're at. Because yep. Tiffany Chapon sure did come out. Yep. Jessica sure did come out. And yep. now here you got Canada and Australia. And I just, there when the, the question comes up, are you nervous? <laughs> for what? I've been said this was going to happen. Like I've been wanting this to happen because that's what makes the sport fun. I love yeah. being pushed. I know Tiff will do best if she's being pushed. Jessica, I know she might be a little nervous when she first gets it. It's going to be her first world championship, but I'm going to make sure that she still shows up as her best. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, I think this, the same could be said with any weight class, right? Like yeah. I have so many people that just came out of nowhere, Carlina, Sunita, yeah. Agatha, <laughs> Agatha, yeah. and Jod, like, I mean, what what are we about to see? Yeah, this women's is, it's all it's only going to get worse from here, and worse like in a good way. Mm -hmm. And that's what you want for the sport. You want the sport to grow, and you want all these strong new stories coming out. I've been looking forward to this. Yeah. Why why would I be scared of it if I've embraced it since 2019? You know, and it's exciting. It's exciting for the sport because a lot of these girls are young. I'm going on 32 years old, right? So while we may be on different paths, like it's one of those, like they are what is making this sport right now, these younger generations. And they're only going to be the ones influencing all these other new lifters coming about. So that's exciting. Um, I will say, for myself, so if I can't speak for anybody else, I know my training is going well. You know, I've been with my current situation hitting RP sixes for squats yeah. and deadlifts and inching around four times the body weight on RP six should probably worry some folks. That's all yeah, I got. Absolutely. I mean, you, you made a post yesterday. I think you said something about like, uh, tell us about it. Like you basically said, like, you're going to get fired up now. Um, so yeah, like with these health issues, obviously it took, um, a lot on my emotional and mental state, right? Clearly physical because like I'm in and out of the hospital, I'm having to take like different medicines and everything just to function properly. But, you know, when I first got into the sport, it, I was the, the loud person coming out to the platform. I was flipping my hair. I was this, like I was beating my chest and that, you know, implanted into a lot of women, you know, they were like, this is, this is Heather Connor, mm -hmm. you know, Heather Connor, because she's going to make, you know, who she is. And then as these health issues got a little bit worse, it kind of like that Heather Connor kind of got lost somewhere. And as much as I wanted to get her back out, like that intensity that I used to bring was just scared, essentially. It was scared to come out because, you know, with heart complications, with um, hormonal situ like complications, like it's almost like, okay, if my adrenaline's too high, if my heart rate's too high, what's about to happen? You know, so I was being very conscientious about my body, but, you know, now being in a situation where I am on the right medication, I am starting to feel good. Now that Heather's like, Hey, Hey girl, remember me? Because, and that's what people want. It's talking about social media, chirp and chirp. That's all they do. And um, I made the comment the other day at the gym 
when somebody was kind of like in a funk and I was explained, and this is the, this is the process. Sometimes you get injured. I said, can you imagine going to a world championship where people want you to fail? They will watch you just to see you fail. Oh, she's hurt. She has health issues. She's not going to do anything. Uh Uh-oh. Like, I'm not the person you want to light the fire under. Mm -mm. (laughs) So it's safe to say there is a fire. It's like, it's pretty dangerous fire. It's like one that's just going to like keep spreading. Right. Um, And, and I will laugh in the whole process. I will laugh at the situation because the only person that really knows how their body's feeling is the person that is feeling it. Yeah, of course. And I competed at nationals, still put up an amazing total. Obviously it got me qualified for worlds, but I had a cyst rupture the size of a grapefruit. (laughs) So, you know, um, that was very painful and I did what I could, but when you are, you know, cause a lot of people are like, how did you even put on your belt? Oh, my adrenaline was high too, yeah. you know? Um, but the one thing that, you know, because I do talk a lot about mental health online and I think that's why a lot of people really can't get to me. Cause they were like, how do these comments not get to you? You know what? Internally, I've been at a worse place and I felt more pain internally than I ever have externally. Like I have been in the darkest, the darkest of places. Like people don't know that story. And it's fine because it's not their business. But until that pain matches that, I'm fine. Mm -hmm. And I can promise you it never will. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because there, you know, we all have grown up differently. And there's been some things that have happened to me in my life. You ain't matching that. Like, absolutely not. And if you try, please. <laughs> so these yeah. comments online, you ain't hurt me. You, you, you ain't. So keep talking. I'm going to keep laughing and I want to show up at worlds. And I don't know, man, I feel it deep in my soul that something crazy is about to happen. I feel it. That's so exciting, Heather. I mean, you're in now, like you said, I mean, you were in a weight class kind of of your own for a while. And now there's at least two other like superstars in that weight class with you. There's up and coming newcomers that we're talking about from other countries as well. I mean, we might be looking at some kind of five-way battle and that's only good for everyone. It's good for the sport to see people going head to head and for us to have this depth in every weight class um, and to have this exciting, because that's what sports is. I mean, if you just know Heather Connor is going to show up and win, then it's not as exciting. It's not going to, you know, get people to be interested in the sport of powerlifting. Obviously, if you want to see huge lifts, you're going to tune in, you can see people lift heavy weights. That's one thing. But if you want to be interested in it as a sport where like game day decision-making and execution, those kind of things are going to determine who the winner is, not necessarily who's the strongest. Um, that's what really makes it a sport and what makes it exciting for people. And that was what will inspire the next generation. And just to get back to what something, you know, on Sheffield, what you were talking about is like it's Sheffield 2019 <clears throat> or 2020 it was going to inspire people to say like, look at this thing that we can all shoot for now to get us to get more people into the sport. Like, Holy cow, they're giving away this much money. They're going to put on this massive production and make us like in the rock stars, this kind of thing. And you see new rock stars emerging, like you said, Tiff and Jod and all these, um, just looking at the numbers uh, right now, the live stream from Sheffield has 192,000 views. So, I mean, we're talking about the whole next generation of lifters might have just saw that, um, you know, that competition yesterday. And I wonder how many new like Heather Connors and Leah Bavlaws and stuff and Amanda Lawrence's that are going to be coming out of this 192,000 people that watched this live stream and saw like the greatest powerlifting meet in history and how many more people are going to be inspired by it it's exciting times to be involved in powerlifting right now. Like we're really entering, I think the golden era. I mean, Sheffield, if that, if that didn't get you excited to go into the, your next training session, yeah. um, what did, you know, get out of the sport. You don't, you're not eating anyways. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, yeah. Take a rest if you need to, but um, yeah, like it, it showcased, like if they can do this, so can I, exactly. that 47 kilo just did that. I can probably do that, but you don't know unless you get out there and try it. 
And I just mm-hmm. cheering on everybody. Like oh. be in your corner, whether you like me or not, you're going to hate that I am cheering for you. Um, but I do, I do want, it doesn't matter if you're going against me. Um, I want you to do your absolute best. I don't want to go against somebody who's hurt or somebody that's had a terrible day. I want to go against their strongest form because that's exciting. You want that final deadlift to be the make or break. And I'm just yeah. going to tell them to it up, load it up. Because sure. we put ourselves in a situation to where whatever they load, I'm going to hit it. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, okay, so let's, let's do a quick, uh, I mean, it's going to be amazing to see you at your full peak form again at IPF Worlds in Malta. And obviously there's going to be all these other battles on the women's side. Let's quickly talk about the men's side battles that we could see at IPF Worlds. Um, we're looking here. Yeah. You have to kind of think about it hard because most of these, uh, people, the men are pretty head and shoulders above their competitors around the world. And so it's looking like team USA is going to be super stacked as we, you know, talked about the performances that they've had, you know, so just running through them again, you know, Jesus is going to be a three time, a three time world champion. Like that's pretty much obvious Keiko and Gavin, which looks like, I mean, pretty much taking home gold and silver. Um, the, the biggest challenger last year was Emil and, you know, we saw that or, or not Emil. Uh, yeah. Emil Krastev. And so he put up at eight thirty seven, quite a bit below. He also had troubles at euros. Um, so we'll see if he can come back to peak form, but right now it's looking like, you know, if you have a thousand dollars to bet, put it on Keiko and Gavin to take that weight class. And then if we keep moving on down Delaney, Tim Monagati is out there somewhere, but, um, and we know Ina is packing a huge deadlift, but this total that he put up here would have won him at worlds by like something like 40 kilos or something crazy like that. So he's pretty far head and shoulders above the rest. We got Taylor Atwood. We know his story. He's, he's above uh, pretty much everyone. We got Michael Davis. He's in a battle, you know, no question about it. He, he has to beat Emil head to head. And then also if Anatoly shows up, that is a juggernaut. So that will be one to watch for the Americans. Um, we've got Waskar Carpio in the 59s. He's a sure win if 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 Fedo doesn't show up, which I've been told Russia is not going to be there. So Waskar is a gold medal. Um, and then we've got Brian Lee. And now this is kind of the interesting one um, as it relates to Sheffield because we had Kyoto, Kyoto, uh, competing at Sheffield and he didn't have a very good performance. He had a, he put up a 685, um, which if you look at Brian Lee, Brian Lee, uh, whoops, I just lost my spreadsheet here. He put up a 713.5. So oh, at, at our national, it. what's that? Panna just competed. Panna did. Yeah. And what did Panna do? Let me look. Let's, let's pull up. I'll pull it up. While um, you guys are talking about, so good to qualify for worlds or yeah. Yeah. It was, I think French nationals. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, oh, it's not up. It's not up yet. Um, we'll have to 687.5. Okay. So Brian Lee, 713.5. Um, Brian Lee is an absolute animal in the 66 weight class. Now the, qu- the th- key thing is though, if you can pull up Kyoto, I think he did a seven ten and a half or something like that at Japan Nationals last week, which again, okay, so this has to be something that has to be talked about as well. We got to look at the timing of Sheffield um, because we had Great Britain. So we're talking about Joy Namani doing her five hundred point five and going, you know, head to head with Jod, but she just had to. She just went all out last week at Great Britain's. Yeah nationals we just had Kyoto go at japanese nationals last week we had france like you said two weeks ago right we had our nationals a month out we had canada nationals like a month out from sheffield so something's got a you know all these nationals happening at the same time as sheffield it seems like sheffield should move and all those nationals should stay where they are because that's that's really around the right time when you want to have a nationals to then give enough prep to lead into worlds over the summer. I mean, there's a reason why all these countries do their nationals at that time and worlds happens in June. So go ahead, other. The Americans always had to just back to back comps. How does it feel? Yeah. 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 <laughs> no, but it should be moved. Um, 
just to make it like a fair advantage for everybody because we again we want people to compete at their best yeah. right and if they're having to compete like a week later you know i mean yeah. oh from great britain who was the last second wild card to get i mean what was that like a week and a half out he was just like oh i'm ready yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, he think that in some ways the fact that Great Britain's Nationals yeah. was last week kind of helped him because he was already yeah. peaking for that. But uh, but it messed him up a little bit. I mean, one week difference, you know. And and I don't think I'm not sure what his numbers came in at here, but I know, yeah. I mean, he missed he misses all of his thirds. You well, know, he went so for uh, um, was Becky's. I know I said that wrong. Um, mm-hmm. All time world record deadlift. Like he could have changed it, but he's like, no, nah, I'm going for it. Yeah. Which, which if, um, he just would have upped it by like, uh, I want to say, yeah. If, if he would have just made the smaller jump, he could have podiumed. Yeah. Let's see. Um, yeah. I mean, he finished in the one Oh fives with a 900. So he, he, if he had 10 more, he would have still lost to Michael and Emil. Okay. So he would have, you know, but yeah, I mean, something like that. If he, I mean, if he, cause he took a huge jump mm-hmm. on his third. So he took a 21 kilo jump. Yeah. If he had taken 15 or 17, you know, he's definitely could have been in the mix. He's definitely a threat. He's definitely dangerous uh, in the one Oh fives, which but we, we didn't mention him. Um, that one Oh five, Mikey, Emil, Abdul, Anatoly, I mean, damn, like that is a stacked class. I want to think it was, never mind, it's super irrelevant. Never mind. <laughs> All right, no worries. So, yeah, um, and I know Kyoto, like what, whatever the number was, it was like 710, something like that. He's 710, 711, somewhere, somewhere in that range where he's right there with Brian Lee as far as what he's capable of. Um, so, that will be an interesting battle to see. But, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that is everything. I think we went through basically all of the, you know, the the US IPF World Championship team that will be going to Malta and kind of gave a little bit of a preview of like things to come. Was Julia, did you have anything that you wanted to add to those? Um, not really. I just more had a closing statement about Sheffield and overall yeah, for for powerlifting. Um I think, you know, Heather touched on this. Um Obviously, all of those people at Sheffield, they're all very talented and they all work very hard. But I think what really separates people who are great in this sport is, and this is for all the people who are watching Sheffield and, you know, want to see themselves up there one day. Um, the biggest thing that I see is is mindset. Like, there are some people who watch powerlifting and they make excuses for why they are not there. And then there are people who watch powerlifting and they say, like, why can't that be me? And why can't I be even better? And those are the people, you know, granted, you have to work hard. Granted, you have to have some genetic propensity to do well in this sport. But those are the people overwhelmingly who are champions. So if you're watching Sheffield and or any of these other meets, and you want to be up there, just remember that. I mean, all these people, you know, they may have started out ahead of where you are, but they all had, they started out below where they're at now. And I think that that is a very important thing to remember. No, that's awesome. That's a great, that's a great closing statement. Heather, do you have anything, any final thoughts? No, like Julia just, she crushed it. Absolutely. And, um, that's why she's here. That's why she's part of our media team. She's got these wise words. They only come out when we force her on the podcast or when she writes the captions. Um, so a lot of the caption uh, that you saw yesterday and on that post leading up to Sheffield, you know, were written by Julia. So thank you so much for all of that. Um, but yes, I think final thoughts for me is just, this was the greatest meeting in powerlifting history. And I don't think it's unquestionable. I think it will push the sport forward. I think if everyone can just see what they saw yesterday and try to take one element from that and add it into your meets, you know, add it into your local meets, add it into your national championships, add it into IPF worlds, even, you know, some of these features that they had, like, you know, the roaming cameras and just like the, the lighting and and the production value and how quick they were to update the standings and things like this, like just 
this made our sport look like a professional sport more than anything I've ever seen before. This looked like something, a professional sport. I, I just can't believe that you have someone at Nike or someone at Gatorade or someone at Toyota's marketing team, something sees this, their eyes are just going to absolutely light up. I mean, like if we're trying to get major sponsors into the sport that you have, like in football and in baseball, you know, some of these big sports like NBA, this is what we need. Do we need to take this and go and show them like, Hey, Gatorade, look at what we have here. You know what I mean? Like we have something here that is a legitimate pro sport that needs to get the attention of everyone in the world. And it's ripe for the picking right now. Whoever wants to come in and be one of these big corporate sponsors are going to, you know, it's, they're going to be the first mover, you know, and obviously SBD is the first mover. They're the ones that have done all of this hard work and, and Aleko, our other partner. Um, but yeah, hats off to everyone at SBD for pulling off an amazing, absolutely the best power of thing competition we've ever witnessed. Um, it was just amazing for us to be able to, you know, the time, what a time to be alive, right? Like we have powerlifting competitions that look like this now, and it's all thanks to the people at SBD. Agreed. Great performance. So, all right. Well, with that, that was the Power of Teen America podcast recap, Sheffield recap show. Um, thank you so much for joining us, Heather and Julia. Appreciate you. Thank you. All right. Peace out.